In this video, we're going to uh, have a discussion about second order effects. So these are, um, you know, it's kind of a big deal with steel because of steel's propensity to buckle. But before we start looking at how do we calculate them and how do we contend with them, let's just sort of uh, define what they are. And one of the best ways to do that is to define them uh, sort of in terms of first order effects. So first order effects are uh, deformations from applied loads and moments. So um, as you've been going through uh, and learning your um, learning statics, learning how to calculate deflections, uh, sort of the first order effect stuff that um, has really been um, sort of the, the entirety of what your uh, education has been thus far. Um, and so, you know, be these, these can be coming from either uh, determinate or indeterminate, but this is really, you know, uh, what we think about when we have the, uh, the loads that we apply to a structure and the immediate deformations, which um, are a result of those applied loads or moments. Uh, in contrast, uh, second order effects are additional uh, moments and deformations which um, are caused by this uh, an eccentricity created by the deformations in from the first order uh, loads which were applied and it's really this eccentricity and the um, uh, sort of the internal forces uh, lining up with the um, you know sort of being misaligned sorry having an eccentricity uh, with the applied loads uh, that, you know, creates these second order effects and really just sort of, uh, you know, boosts up the moments and the deformations. So there's really two main kinds. Um, there's what we, uh, so you know, we can think about them in different ways of, of different buckling. So we have sort of our classic Euler buckled shape uh, where, you know, we have some force here at the end and we buckle out here um, in the middle, and we have this little, uh, we buckle out by a deformation uh, delta. And so, you know, how is this a second order effect? Well, you know, the uh, internal force in the beam is going to, sort of, if we follow my pen around, it will be doing this as sort of a vector. So when it's here, well, there's a force couple um, between, you know, we use my red pen as the, uh, the applied force. Well, there's a force couple between the applied force and the line of action here. And so that's going to, uh, you know, create an additional moment, and that additional moment is going to create uh, more deformation. And so this is what we call P little delta. Uh, and we tend to see this in brace systems, and it's really uh, an individual member response. And so uh, you'll see, and this is why, you know, it's uh, Euler buckling uh, sort of is uh, derived really for this case. Um, the other case that we are going to deal with is what's called P big delta, or often just called P delta uh, effects. Um, this is what happens when we have a side sway uh, of our compression member, and so you can see we get this rather large uh, eccentricity delta, and so we have a moment caused uh, by P times that distance. And uh, P delta is really a system level response. And so you'll see this with the in entire story of a building moving over. Um, and that's going to create an additional demand, uh, an additional bending moment demand in the column. So, you know, one of the challenges uh, with uh, these second order effects is that uh, because they are dependent upon your first order deformations and they're going to apply. Uh, they're going to uh, you know, generate an additional moment, and that moment's going to generate more deformations, which is going to generate an additional moment. They're really, really complicated to um, uh, to calculate with sort of you know hand calculations and, and closed form solutions. And so, um, in design, well, we don't want to have to deal with those complications. So what we do is we essentially uh, we calculate our second order effects simply by amplifying up uh, what these first order moments would be. Um, and that's, we can, we can get away with that if we meet a few conditions. Um, one is that the, uh, the second order effects uh, are relatively small. Uh, and if they're rel relatively small, that means that these deformations will be uh, relatively small. So our geometric nonlinearities uh, are, are close enough to an approximation to a, uh, a linear method uh, by simply just scaling up these first order effects. Um, 
If they're too large, well then, you know, the standard points is to uh, using Appendix E. Really what Appendix E is, is that we have to do a, um, a separate uh, second order effect uh, calculation. And so, you know, all right, that's, we've sort of discussed the, the general overview. So what do we, you know, how do we actually go about um, doing this amplification? Well, you know, we've got it sort of in three different steps. The first thing that we'll do is we'll calculate this um, lambda C factor, which is really our elastic buckling load factor. Uh, it's this lambda C which tells us whether uh, we're, you know, too large to... Uh, just simply amplify these uh, sec these first order uh, demands um, or not, and so that's our that's our first one. This really just tells us uh, whether we you're in, in camp number one where we're just going to amplify the uh, first order uh, demands, or if we're in camp number two where we need to do a specific uh, second order analysis. Once we've done that. Uh, we find the appropriate amplification factor, so it's either this delta B or delta S. And so delta B is used uh, in, in brace systems, it's really looking at this uh, P little delta uh, behavior, and then while delta S is for sway systems, it's the amplifying um, factor that we put onto the first order moments for a sway system, and uh, it's for our P delta. And once we do that, then that's exactly all we do is our, uh, our new demands, which we're going to design our, uh, our compression element for, will just be the first order moments multiplied uh, by the respective um, factor. So in doing that, let's just sort of jump in and we'll just start looking uh, for at these brace systems and looking at delta B and how we calculate that. So. Uh, for our brace systems, the first thing we need to do is we need to determine this lambda c. And so lambda c uh, is just really going to equal the uh, minimum of lambda mb. And I'll just kind of keep a little bit of a, a running um, sort of reference here for you if you want to go look up. Uh, where these are in the standard, that's 4.9.2.2.3. And you'll see, I'll just put it in, in brackets here. So it's the minimum of this lambda mb. So what does lambda mb equal? So lambda mb equals our um, nominal buckling load over our applied load. And what we need to do is we need to calculate this for each column. And, you know, whichever one is, uh, whatever ratio is the smallest, um, that's the one that we'll use to define our lambda C uh, for the system. And... Um, so n star, we know this, n star is just going to be our applied load compression and you know what is this n mob, this nominal uh, buckling load, so n o m b uh, simply equals pi squared times e for i times ke times l squared. So this, oh, this is pretty straightforward. This is just um, Euler buckling, where um, ke times l, this is our effective length. So if you remember, le equals uh, ke uh, times l. And because we're working with a brace member, uh, this Ke uh, will always be uh, less than or equal to 1. All right, so that's, um, that's not a, a, a terribly difficult bit. And so, you know, we'll, um, if, we, uh, so if we go ahead and we uh, determine this lambda MB for, for each member in our, um, in our system, uh, well, then we'll get our lambda C. 
And then, you know, we need to sort of see, well, what does this lambda c mean? And we'll put it into some uh, different uh, sort of category. So if lambda c is greater than or equal to 10, then no amplification is required. So, you know, let's think about what does that mean physically. Um, that means, you know, this ratio is just looking at the ratio of sort of what our Euler buckling load would be uh, to over our um, uh, applied load. And it's saying that, you know, if we have a ratio such that uh, we're at least 10 times, our demand is at least 10 times lower um, than what our critical buckling load is, well, then we're, we're not going to have to... Um, you know, amplify um, our uh, our first order moments, and that makes sense because if if our applied load is so so low, um, you know, you know, a tenth of what this critical buckling load is, that means we're really not going to buckle. Or if we buckle, it's only going to be very very slight. So uh, you know, that should make some make some sense intuitively if we stop and think about it. Um, the the next category we're going to look at is if uh, lambda c is less than 3.5, well then a second order analysis is required. And again that makes sense because that means that our uh, we've approached our, our um, applied Excuse me. Um, our applied load is approached very quickly, uh, very close to this uh, nominal buckling load, and so uh, we we would expect you know actually quite large deformations there. Um, and so, well, if we've got large deformations, then uh, you know this that sort of linear approach isn't going to work for this uh, geometric nonlinearity. And then, so our third category. Is, uh, is really the one that we are, are most interested in here for, for the sake of this video. So if 3.5 is less than or equal to lambda c, uh, which is less than 10, well then uh, our um, uh, amplification factor, delta b, is going to equal cm over 1 minus 1 divided by lambda c and it's going to be greater than or equal to 1.0 so that's worth sort of boxing up all right so that's not too bad we're, we're almost home free well we know what lambda c is so this is 1 over lambda c uh, we're basically just inverting uh, this equation here so what is the cm factor so CM is uh, really a, a loading factor which depends upon uh, what our moment distribution is. So we'll just write down CM depends on loading. And so they, there's a, a factor for, you know, if we have... Um, you know, end moments and, you know, end moments only, so just uh, at the top and the bottom uh, applied moments, which we, we tend to get in a gravity load system, or if we've got a, a transverse load pushing in. We'll look at the end moment one only, and so, you know, for... moments in, uh, we'll just say column. So it's in for end moments, and we'll just put in only here. Uh, for end moments only, well, then we get uh, CM equals 0 0.6 minus 0 0.4 uh, times this factor beta M. And so uh, beta M is really 
uh, just going to be the ratio of the uh, the moment demand uh, at the uh, top and at the bottom. So M1 over M2, and it's um, positive if there's reverse curvature. and it's negative if in single curvature. And also um, M1 is just going to be uh, the smaller of the two uh, moments, and just sort of by definition. So let's draw, you know, sort of pictorially, what do we mean, what's going on here? Uh, so say we have a, uh, so say we have a column. And that column's there, and it has uh, some applied load, P, P, and then it has a, a moment, and the moments are going to be such um, that they're going to put this into single curvature only. And so, you know, our um, deflected shape will look something like this. So let's just call this uh, P, P, and we'll call this one M, M. And so, of course, we have our uh, displacement delta. And then the, uh, the moment is just helping sort of add to that displacement. So if we draw our, um, our bending moment diagram, we'll just say that's our uh, bending moment diagram. Well, um, in fact, let's call this M naught uh, just to sort of differentiate it. Well, first, you know, we have some portion which is just coming from, you know, M naught, uh, just that applied moment there. And then uh, we have a, uh, an addition, so that's the M naught, so that's fine, that's constant across there. And then we have an additional moment which changes uh, based upon our eccentricity uh, away from sort of our, our center line and our applied load. And that's just going to sort of apply... Uh, like this, and um, you know, this value is just going to be, you know, p times delta. Well, yeah, I guess you know this value in here, and that makes sense because you know, force times a distance that equals a moment. So if we do this, um, our uh, you know the two moments, top and bottom, are the same, so that's going to be one. Uh, it's in single curvature, so it's a negative, so beta m equals negative 1. Uh, negative 1 times uh, negative 4 equals a uh, no, 0 0.04. 0 0.4 uh, equals a positive 0 0.4. Um, so uh, cm is going to be uh, equal to 1.0. Uh, which is really the, the maximum it can be, and this is really our worst case. Uh, let's look at a case where we've got, uh, you know, a reverse curvature going on. So uh, here's our column, and then again we'll put some loads on it. P and P. Except this time, we'll put uh, uh, the moment at the top, M1, up here. And we'll put the moment at the bottom, M2, uh, down here. And so our deflected shape will be something like that, where you know we'll have some distance uh, uh, delta uh, in here. And that makes sense. So while this wants to buckle, uh, you have the two moments uh, also trying to uh, crank it and deform it. And so, you know, what does our, um, our bending moment diagram look like then? 
So, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, superposition, and I'm going to add uh, a number of bending moment diagrams together. So, the first one, so M2, uh, M2 is going to be the bigger one, you know, just sort of by definition, and you know, we're we're, we're making up this example here, so um, we might as well make the 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 bottom the uh, the bigger moment. So we have a a moment demand uh, from these two, uh, which looks like this, where it's uh, you know it's coming across as a um, uh, you know linearly uh, varying with the height. Um, now the uh, deflected shape that we have, uh, this sort of p delta, uh, is going to do something like. this. And so if we add those two together, we end up with a bending moment diagram, um, which looks something like this, where we'll have uh, that M1. So this is M1, this is M2. And then we'll just add the two together. And then we get a bending moment distribution, which looks something like that. And so, you know, it's through this, um, and sort of this is, you can hopefully see a little bit of how, at least graphically, how, how this sort of P little delta adds on to our um, overall moment demand. And so um, we'll just sort of wrap up on the brace section and just saying that, you know, delta B max uh, is going to equal uh, 1.4. And that is when lambda C equals 3.5. So I mean that's a, that should seem fairly straightforward on how we apply the uh, the brace section. Uh, again, all we're doing is looking at a ratio of uh, the applied load uh, to what the Euler buckling um, uh, moment would be for the um, for the section uh, which we're investigating, uh, and then we look at you know what the uh, application of our applied moments are um, to that uh, to that element and then we can work out what our amplification factor is. Now, if we have a sway system, now again, so to, to back up, we did, um, you know, we did the brace system, you know, for each member. This was an individual member thing. So for a brace system, uh, it's really a, a story failure. And so this is the entire system wants to rack over, and um, you know you'll have this uh, really large this p big delta, so p delta. And you can imagine if you had a a series of these columns and they're connected as a frame, they're all going to rack over together because they're all connected. Um, so you know how do we how do we determine this? Well, we look at again our first step. Uh, we want to determine a lambda c. And this lambda c, just as a reminder, is to tell us how big this second order effect is and whether we can um, uh, simply modify our first order um, demands or if we need to do a, a specific uh, second order analysis. So lambda c for a, a sway system is the minimum of lambda ms and we uh, calculate for all this for each story. All right, so you know what's this lambda ms and lambda ms is just going to be, um, you know, sum for the story. 
of the uh, nominal buckling load. But you see this one's an S, while previously um, uh, we had a nominal B. So this is B for brace, this is S for sway, um, divided by the length over the uh, sum for the story. N star over L. So a few things to note, and again this will be in um, you know, section 4.9.2.3.2 um, of NZS 3404 if you're interesting. So something to note, this that we're using here is L. So we're using L and not LE, uh, which just seems sort of odd, you know, when we uh, were determining our uh, nominal buckling. He's like, well, you know, we seem to have this KE factor, and this is exactly why we're using L here. Um, is because our uh, effective length is already accounted for in this uh, nominal buckling capacity, this nominal buckling load uh, for the sway. And that's, you know, we'll just say uh, not LE. Um, and we'll say that the effective length is already... taken into account with N O M S. All right, so let's look at what this N O M S is and how it differs from N O M B. So our noms uh, looks very similar. It's pi squared. EI over KE L squared. Except we're just going to use the KE for a sway system. Uh, which means that KE will be greater than 1.0. All right, well, that's uh, that's sort of our first step is, you know, how do we calculate um, lambda C? And, you know, once we have that, uh, let's just like with our brace system, let's look and see, well, what are the different categories it might fall into? So if lambda C is uh, greater than or equal to 10, uh, just like with our brace system, no second order effects. Well, no second order effects that we need to uh, um, uh, account for. And this is similar to the uh, the brace system. So you know, if we have a uh, uh, you know all of these you know columns in a story um, over their length uh, over. Uh, sort of what the demand is over their length. You know, if if this um, if the critical buckling load is ten times over what the demand is, we go like ah, we can ignore the second order effects. Now, if um, lambda c is less than five, um, then we need to do a second order analysis. to specific second order analysis. Um, now again, a sort of a interesting point here with the limit for when we need to do a specific second order analysis for a sway system is five, and with a brace system, 
it was 3.5. And that really just comes down to, you know, sort of these levels of deformation where the, the limit is, uh, you know, higher. Uh, so that, again, remember that lambda, lambda C is just the ratio of the applied load over the uh, uh, nominal buckling load, Euler buckling load. Um, well, you can see with this, you know, the with a sway system, we're going to get uh, much bigger um, uh, deformations for a given load. And so that's why that we, we sort of bump this limit up from when we need to do a second order analysis, because it's going to be a much bigger deformation uh, than we'll see in a brace system. All right, and then, you know, our, our magic one, if, uh, if we're in the Goldilocks zone, if, you know, 5 is less than or equal to lambda c, which is less than 10, uh, then we do our, our first order uh, amplification, just using the amplification factor. So we have delta s equals 0 0.95 over 1 minus 1 over lambda c. And this delta s uh, is going to be, uh, you know, applied to all the members in the sway system. And you can find that in, you know, section 4.4.3.3.2. So we found delta s. Do we just uh, amplify our moments? Not quite. So the, um, uh, the sway system is just slightly different than the braced in that, you know, the sway um, sort of acknowledges that you could either have uh, this or this be your governing case. Because remember with the, the brace system, we're looking at uh, you know, how does the, we're also accounting for uh, the, the moments which are uh, being applied uh, while we're not, as you can see, uh, we're not doing that with this sway system. So, um, you know, f for sway, we need to calculate both delta B and delta S. So, once delta B and delta S. are found, delta M equals the uh, greater of delta B versus delta S, and so your M star equals delta M, M star. And so basically what we do is we find uh, both of these, whichever one of these factors is larger, uh, that's the one that we'll apply uh, only when we are in a sway system. Um, and sort of the final sort of interesting thing to look at here is that uh, in a sway system, Uh, once the second order effects um, have been applied, then the uh, effective length factor that we'll use uh, is going to be equal to 1 for the member design.
And so that seems kind of weird, you know, in our in our brace factor, if we um, go through and we find delta B, we end up using the same, you know, KE less than or equal to one for, for our member design. So why wouldn't we do it for our, um, our sway system? Well, what it is is that, um, you know, your effective length KE will be greater than one when you're looking at your uh, nominal um, you know, buckling load. And so because that nominal buckling load is put into our uh, delta S, well, then we've already essentially accounted for um, all of that additional moment uh, that would come in and sort of by that additional moment that's going to, uh, in, the, in a sense, um, reduce down our, uh, you know, our compression capacity, uh, which does the same thing as, you know, for our uh, Euler buckling increasing our effective length. So when we do our, our design and we, we select our section, uh, we just use a KE of 1 because we've already accounted for that sway system. If we used a KE, if we used the same KE that we used in this, um, you know, nominal buckling uh, load, well then we would essentially be double counting. Um, and we'd be really penalizing the column uh, and, and not really uh, taking into account the fact that um, this KE is only greater than one uh, because of the sway, because of this amplification. So um, that sort of wraps up what I want to go over with you with uh, second order effects. Uh, again, they're, the second order effects are, are just, uh, you know, they're extra moments and deformations uh, which are caused by having a, a line of action uh, which is outside uh, where the applied load is uh, from our first order moments. And so all we do to find them is we uh, we determine you know how close are we to our critical buckling load with this lambda c factor. Uh, then we determine either delta b or delta s, which are our amplification factors, and then we just amplify our first order moments uh, by these amplification factors. And this is what we use to design the section. So with that, uh, I'd like to say. Thanks for watching.